Book of Colossians chapter 3. I want to, in a few moments this morning, share with you what I will loosely call the secret of walking with God. It's really no secret at all. It's plainly in the book. But sometimes we get misdirected and sometimes we think that it's something other than the simplicity of what it is. Colossians chapter 3, beginning with verse 1. Paul is speaking to the church at Colossae. And he says, if you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above and not on things on this earth. Before we go any further, I want to just acknowledge the Lord in prayer and my need for his anointing. Father, we come to you once again, daring not to step forward into your word, Lord, except we acknowledge our dire need for your Holy Spirit. I'd ask you this morning that you'd anoint my lips and that you'd quicken my mind and quicken my spirit and that you'd anoint the ears and the hearts of your people, that the engrafted word might go out unabated, that it might find good ground and bring forth the fruit that you desire. Father, in Jesus' name we pray it and we thank you. Amen and amen. It's interesting to me how Paul begins this passage of scripture. Because he's not talking to the whole of the human race. As a matter of fact, if you, if, in reality, the, the Bible is not to the whole of the human race. The Bible was written to the church. There's really only one word in the Bible for a sinner, and that's repent. Everything else here is for you and I to learn how to walk in righteousness and godliness. How to be conformed to the image of Christ. And so he begins this passage of scripture with the word if. If you be risen with Christ. It's, a, it's important and has a theological meaning. When you gave your heart and life to Jesus Christ. In the mind of God, because of your faith in Christ. In the mind of God, he sees you crucified with Christ. He sees you hanging on that cross with Jesus Christ and all of your sins are punished on that cross. In other words, because of your faith in Jesus, you were co-crucified with Christ. When they buried him, you were co-buried with Christ. The old man was put into the grave. And on the third day when Jesus was resurrected, you too were resurrected. You were risen with Christ, able to walk in the newness of life. Hence, Paul says, if you be risen with Christ. He's talking about people who have come through the born again experience. And just a side note here, every human being on the planet is eligible to be born again. <laughs> God is not trying to eliminate anybody. He has gone to great pains and paid a great price to include everybody, but it is all based upon whether you will evidence faith in Jesus Christ. If you be risen with Christ... Here's the secret on how to have a wonderful life. Set your affection on things above. Set your affection on, uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I misquoted that. Seek those things which are above where Christ sits on the right hand of God. In other words, you are to live your life seeking heavenly things. It's counterintuitive to the human being because we, by nature, we seek a bigger house, a better car, a better paycheck. And there's nothing wrong with that, but don't let that be your priority. You're going to be disappointed at the end of life if that was your priority. So he says, number one, set your affection. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I'm jumping ahead. Seek those things which are above where Christ sits on the right hand of God. And this is the, the crux of what he's saying. Set your affection on things above. And he just told you now, what, what's above? That's where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your affection, your desires, your love. Set it all upon Jesus Christ. But it's not just do that. He says, do that, and then he tells you what not to do. You got to do them both. <laughs> set your affection on things above, and do not set your affections on things of this earth. And you're not going to do that on day one because we have been trained to seek earthly things. 
You've seen the bumper sticker, the one with the most toys wins. Have you ever seen that? The one with the most toys does not win. The one with the most of Jesus wins. Because your toys stay here. But what you know about Jesus, it goes on into eternity with you. I heard just recently this man, Howard Hughes, one of the richest moguls that has lived. Someone was in the room in a hotel where he, where he passed away after a sickness. The hotel was in Tijuana. He didn't have a room. He had the entire top floor. When you stood at the window looking, overlooking the Pacific, it was one of the most beautiful visions that you'd ever want to see. And the man was standing there looking out and saying, man, Mr. Hughes had a wonderful view. And one of the men that worked at the hotel said he never saw it. There was a room in the inside of that floor with no windows and one door. That's where he stayed. His life so miserable, so fear, so gripping his life. He was in that one room until he died. He had all the toys. <laughs> But he didn't win. So he says to you and I, we are to set our affection on things above. Set your affection, set your heart, set your love on Christ. Listen, it's easy to say it with our lips. But it's a whole different thing for your whole day to be full of Jesus Christ. It's a whole different thing for you to turn on the alarm clock early. Not, not in time to go to work, early. And get up early and don't wake nobody up and slip into the other room and get on your knees and get alone with God. And just fellowship with him and pour your heart upon him. It's, it's a whole different thing to live your life as such that you set your affection upon him. And it's a whole different thing to not set your affections on things of this earth. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say some things. I love everybody. I'm not mad at nobody. But the world is constantly putting things in front of your faith to see if it can catch your attention. The brand new synthetic weave. Is, is synthetic not good? <laughs> the brand new motorcycle. The YouTube channel. I'm going to be a YouTube star. I'm going to be an Instagram celebrity. The world is constantly putting things in front of you. Because what it intends to do is to allow the cares of this life to choke out your love affair with Jesus Christ. Until you're just a walking shell of the Christian you used to be. You remember who you used to be, but it's no more who you are. You used to have fellowship divine, but now there's an emptiness on the inside. There's a broken communion that causes you to struggle. And I'm saying uh, every Christian, I don't care who you are, goes through periods of dryness in your life. It's no preacher that doesn't go through dryness in their life. But the same answer for the preacher is the same answer for the laity. Set your affections back on things above. <laughs> And not on things of this earth. Begin to once again go after Jesus. Here's what he said in the Old Testament. He, no matter what trials, no matter what tests, he said, those that keep their minds stayed on me, I will keep them in perfect peace. Do you have peace this morning? Or is it a memory? Do you have peace rolling through your soul? Are you in fellowship with God, with the Prince of Peace? Or is it a distant memory that you remember five, ten years ago? I used to have, I used to be in a place with God, but now I've moved away. Now it's cold and it's dry and my, my prayer echoes off of the ceiling. If that's your case, Jesus has not forgotten you. And he's telling you today, set your affection back on things above. Get your mind off of this world. Get your heart off of this world. And look to Jesus once again. He's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. He hadn't changed. He loves you as much today. Somebody says, but you don't know what I've done, preacher. <laughs> it doesn't matter what you've done. It simply doesn't matter. No, you shouldn't have done it. If you feel guilty about it, you shouldn't have done it. You can still today <laughs> come boldly to the throne of grace.
cry out for help and mercy in the time of need. And he's still a gracious God. He, don't, he loves you as much today as he loved you the day that he touched your life. What is the secret? Set your affection on things above. Get your mind off of this world. Listen, here's something that holds us back. It, it challenges all of us saints. I had a Facebook account. I still got one because the church is under it. But I had it on my phone. I had to let it go. I had to take it off. Sign out. Take it off. We got staff here that manages the church part of it. I don't even go out there. Because it was getting in my way. <laughs> How many of you have just found yourself? <laughs> Forty minutes later. <laughs> but we think it's a, a great feat if we read our Bible 40 minutes. Come on, it gets in the way. It's not evil, it's not wrong. We use it wrong. <laughs> Here's the thing, saints. God expects us, I'm off my message, but this is where the Lord has me. God expects us to learn discipline within our own lives. As Christians, we are to dominate the earth, the earthen vessel. We are to have full control of our passions. Come on, somebody. Amen. Now, we can't... St I'm not going to say that. I, I'm not going to say that. I'll say it differently. How will I say it? <laughs> We all have passions. We're made to be passionate about certain things. And when we have sinful activity in our life, many times we're passionate about our sinful activity. And we're to learn discipline over that. God will teach you. The Holy Spirit will teach you. He will also teach you discipline over your dietary habits. <laughs> I had to figure out how to say it. <laughs> Because when you are in control of the vessel, and I realize people have chemical issues that their body responds differently. I'm, not, I'm, I'm just saying that whether your body responds differently or not, you should dominate your plate. That's the way I want to say it. <laughs> That's how I want to say it. Your body may respond ever how it responds to, due to insulin or whatever, but you should dominate what goes in your mouth. How many know if you don't, you could backslide? <laughs> <laughs> I love bluebell ice cream. I used to. And uh, I would eat like a half a gallon of it in the evening. <laughs> and I did that for months. And I'm a skinny guy. I've always been kind of thin. And I noticed that my body was changing. <laughs> my body was backsliding. I was skinny, then I got fat, then I was skinny again. <laughs> and the Lord began to deal with me. You are to dominate that vessel. You are to control it. And he had to teach me, and it was a learning curve for me. It was, it's a learning curve. You have to learn how to tell yourself no. Remember how God had to, when you first got saved, he had to teach you how to say no to, to sex. Can I just be real this morning? He also got to teach you how to say no to other things. Otherwise, you'll continue to say yes, yes, yes until you get yourself in trouble. But when you find that you're in a struggle and struggles come and struggles goes, and you're in the midst of a war trying to take that next step in the Lord, set your affection back on things above. Get your mind back on Jesus Christ because that's what allows the Holy Spirit to come alongside. He's the helper. He, he's one that's called alongside to help you. Not just to help you, keep you from going to hell. To help you in every trial and in every test of life. And when my wife makes potato, what is that? Potato pie? Sweet potato pie. That's a trial in my house. <laughs> and I'm still growing on that one. <laughs> but you have to go to the Lord and say, Lord, help me to dominate my passions. Help me to have control of, of my whole physical body. 
You do that by keeping your mind and your heart stayed upon him. And that's what sets your affections on him. It means to keep your mind stayed upon him. See, let me tell you, every television program is put there by Satan. I don't care if it's filthy or not. It's put there by Satan to take your mind off of the word of God. Every one of them. I don't care if it's Little House on the Prairie. Or if it's the most lewd stuff on television, it's there. It's a one-eyed devil to take your mind and your heart off of God's word. It's always been that way, but now the devil has doubled down with Instagram and Twitter and, and Facebook. And some of them that are more lewd than those, it's all put there to take up your time, to take your mind off of Jesus. And let's be honest about it, our nation has exploded since those things have come out. People are more hateful now than they've ever been because they can, they can sit there and be a keyboard warrior and fight everybody else in the nation and never have to look them in the eyeball. And our spirits have become hard and we've become mean people. All of it is the plan of Satan. All the way back from when television first came out up until the uh, current. And let me tell you what's coming. I'm going to tell you what's coming right now. <clears throat> You're not even going to have to have a keyboard. You're going to be able to use your brain to think the words on the page. It's already in development. They're already developing it. And now all of a sudden, you are ensconced within this technology. So I said, why are you going to get that? Yes, you are. Yes, you are. <laughs> That's what they said. Why are you going to get a credit card if it's the devil? Well, it's not the devil, but you've got one anyway. But if we keep our hearts and our minds stayed on Jesus Christ, these things will not have the impact upon the children of God that it has upon the world out there. Right now, there's such disharmony in Washington, D.C. that people are absolutely going crazy. Republicans fighting Democrats, Democrats fighting Republicans, being as hateful and as harmful. I don't want to walk with Mr. Trump. I don't want to walk with Mr. Obama. I don't want to walk with Miss Hillary. I want to walk with Jesus. I want my affection set on things above. I don't care what they do over there. It ain't going to make a difference because the tribulation is still coming. Jesus is still coming and this world will be no more. I want to know Jesus. I want to know Jesus. All of us in here, we have trials. We go through tests. It may be your job. It may be your career. It may be your spouse. It may be your children. It may be any number of things. But in every trial, Jesus can keep you in perfect peace if, if, if you would keep your mind stayed upon him. <laughs> Is Jesus in the morning? Is Jesus in the evening? Is Jesus is suffer time. Sometimes my wife can be in the house and she'll say something that she's walking by. I'll quote some scripture at her. <laughs> Hallelujah. We talk King James in our house. <laughs> now, let me show you this. In the book of Matthew, chapter 14. I'm going to begin reading with verse 22, but to give you a backdrop on this, Jesus has just assembled 5,000 people besides the women and children. With five loaves and two little fish, he has fed them all. And in fact, he fed them so good, there was 12 baskets of food left over. <laughs> now figure that math out. He started with, with five loaves and two little fish and ended up with 12 baskets. And you think he can't keep you in peace? See, too many times we try to figure this stuff up ourselves. I got this issue. I got that issue. I got this issue. I got that issue. Oh, here's my solution. Here's my other solution. Here's my other solution. Ah, uh -uh. put your mind back on Jesus. He got you. He got you in your situation. There's not a situation known to man that Jesus doesn't already have the answer. Even if he has to do a miracle, he's got the answer. I had an issue. I had an issue when I first got saved. I was getting ready to marry a woman. I thought I loved her, but she wasn't no good for me. <laughs> and I wasn't no good for her. But we had been together so long, and I was tired of sin. I said, well, I might as well just marry this one. Man, it was going to be a mess. God saved me. 
<laughs> right in the midst of it. Y'all mean literally. <laughs> I'll get ready to mess up. He saved me. And then I needed a miracle. I didn't know it. So he went to the other side of the globe. Found my ex-wife who I hadn't been divorced with for seven years, for six years. Saved her. Put me back on her mind. Put us back together after six years of being apart. Told us both, this is who you're going to marry. And there she sit right there right now. If you need a miracle, God will give you a miracle. Hallelujah. He had just fed the 5,000, it says, and straightway Jesus constrained, meaning that he compelled his disciples to get into the ship and go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And we, when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. Now, I'm sure the disciples didn't like it because it says that Jesus had to compel them. He didn't ask him to get into the ship and go to the other side. He had to compel them. He had to constrain them. He had to force them, get in the ship, like I said, and go to the other side. They didn't want to be apart from him. Lord, you just fed 5,000. Besides the women and children, we don't want to leave. You're the miracle worker. He said, but I'm saying go. Right now, I don't want to be separated from Jesus. I know you're sitting on the right hand of the power on high. But Lord, I'm down here. I'd rather be up there with you. There are times that Jesus requires that we learn how to walk separated from him physically. Not spiritually. We're always connected spiritually. But that you have to learn how to grow up. We can't win a world of sinners sitting in Jesus' lap. We're going to have to get up. And go about the father's business. Jesus didn't do what he did sitting in the father's lap. He had to get up, get down here, and go about the father's business. So it says, he went apart into a mountain to pray. And when evening was come, he was there alone. Now catch the timeline. It began by saying, I believe it's in, you'll have to go back earlier to find. It was the evening setting. It was about sunset when he told his disciples, go to the other side. They went. And it was, he went then into the mountain to pray. And as you look at the timeline of this story, it was not until the third watch of the fourth watch of the night that Jesus began to proceed towards the disciples. The fourth watch of the night is between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. <laughs> Meaning that Jesus prayed all night long. And the disciples were in this situation of being separate from him all night long. It says he, he went into the mountain apart to pray. And when evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. You and I are separated from Jesus Christ now as the disciples were separated then. And sometimes our lives can be tossed. It can be challenged by the vicissitudes of life, the trials, the things that happen in our lives that we don't enjoy. It says the wind was contrary. Sometimes things can happen in our life that's contrary to our will. That ain't what I wanted. Have you ever had those kind? You could be on your job and they move your cubicle right beside that old girl that you hate. <laughs> Moved you out of a cubicle, you're now in an open office and you don't like it. <clears throat> they called you into the office and said, we're going to have to let you go. We're cutting staff. And I know you didn't like that. These are the things that happen to us down here. It's no different than the disciples being on the sea and the waves begin. These are seasoned fishermen, but it is a challenge to them because then waves are coming in and they drop down in the valley. And that wave goes up and they drop down. And sometimes our experience here living for Jesus, it's not always on the mountaintop. Sometimes it goes up and it comes crashing down. And in those times when the waves are, are, are beating against the vessel, 
in those times when life seems like it's throwing everything at you, how do you get through it? Set your affections on things above where Christ sits at the right hand of the power on high. He has not taken his heart off of you. He's got you there because he wants you to learn how to walk through a trial and not act like a baby. See, when he brought Israel out, he led Israel into the wilderness. He led them there. I mean, it wasn't just like the woods. It was a barren, howling wilderness. There was no water. There was no food. And God led them by a pillar of fire and a pillar of smoke right slap dab in the middle of it. Why? To humble them, number one. But number two, to teach them dependence upon him. As I said earlier, if you need a miracle, God will give you a miracle. <laughs> They had nothing to drink. God calls rivers, plural, of water to flow out of a rock. And then he calls that rock to follow them for 40 years. Read your Bible and see if it isn't in there. They, wanted, they, they needed food to eat. God calls railroad cars full of manna, enough to fill, feed three and a half million people every single day. And he said on the... On the sixth day, I want you to grab enough to get some to, for tomorrow, too. In other words, what I'm saying is that wasn't his capacity. He could have dropped down all of it in one week if he wanted to. I mean, in one day, enough for a week. And when they said, we won't meet, he caused the birds to fly over and just fall on them. <laughs> if you need a miracle, he'll give you a miracle. <sighs> but you need to keep your mind stayed on him. See, so here's the problem with modern Christianity. We put our mind on Jesus Christ on Sunday morning. Only. <laughs> and we don't think about him on Monday. We're not really concerned with him too much on Tuesday, Wednesday or Thursday. Friday, we're going to the club. <laughs> <laughs> Saturday, Saturday, we're going to the golf club. And Sunday, oh, I better think about Jesus again. And we end up spending all Sunday repenting for how bad we live from Monday through Saturday. And I'm not fighting. If you got to repent, repent. It's, that's cool. It's better than not. <laughs> Boy, it would be wonderful if on Monday morning you got up and got on your knees beside the bed and said, Lord, I'm not, I'm not very good at this, but God, I want to keep you on my thoughts today. Lord, why don't you nudge me every now and again and remind me that you're walking with me. Every now and again, why don't you st let that still, small voice speak into my heart and let me know that it's real. It says that in the fourth watch of the night, as they're going through all of these headaches, the fourth watch, as I said, is between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m., Jesus went unto them walking on the water. Walking on the water. Man, I mean, by that time, Peter's cussing. He done fought them waves so long, he don't know what to do. I can see them throwing the tackling over, throwing the nets off, trying to lighten the load, and, this, and the ship still going up and down in those waves. And then all of a sudden, they look over, and it's like, he's walking on, he's walking on the water. This trial about to kill us. And he's walking on the water as though it were a cement sidewalk. What does it mean? It means just because you go through a trial, God don't topple out of the throne and fall out on the floor. He's God in the midst of the trial, just like he's God on a sunshiny day. When everything is wonderful, he's God. And when everything goes upside down, he's still God. Years ago, I don't know, 10, 12, whatever it is, years ago, my wife and I, we're coming home. We're just rejoicing in the Lord. I'd go by her job and pick her up. We're driving home together. I think we only had one car at that time. We're rejoicing in the Lord. I mean, we're just, we come into the house. Everything's wonderful. I run. We had a little chihuahua. I tackle the chihuahua, and I'm rolling in the floor playing with the chihuahua. We're on the mountaintop. And I heard a scream from upstairs, my wife. She said, call the ambulance. I knew what in the world. I mean, we just walked in here. I picked up the phone and ran upstairs. 
I believe Tiffany was 21 at the time. She was in the bed dead. My 21-year-old daughter, never sick a day in her life, she was dead. Died of natural causes at 21. I, we left that morning, it was all glory, glory. Came home and her body was already cold. We went from the mountaintop to the depth of the valley in a moment's time. My wife be began to scream as the reality of the situation set in on her. She began to realize I looked into my baby's eyes as I walked into the room. And I said, baby, she's not there anymore. I could see it. The reality began to set in. <laughs> I mean, from here to here in a second. I grabbed my wife's hands. I said, let's pray. <laughs> And we stood in that doorway of that room and we began to call on God. <laughs> and I lie not. <laughs> the peace that passes all understanding just flooded our heart in that same moment. In that same moment, just peace came like a river into our hearts. The ambulance and the, 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 everybody came, the police, the fire engine, everybody came and we, they, they began to do whatever they do. <laughs> And I remember the, the, the police, the policeman there, my wife was in the front yard talking to somebody and I was over to the side and I remember him saying that you need to talk to uh, this, I don't know what it was, a, a chaplain or psychiatrist, I don't know what it was. You need to talk to this man, he can help you through it. I go, well, I, I mean, I'm cool. I mean, they're not eyes as dry as it could be. I said, no, I'm cool, man. I'm, I'm a preacher, brother, it's cool. He said, well, sometimes these things can have a devastating impact. <laughs> when we went to the funeral home, you know, they take advantage of you. If you had never been one to arrange for a funeral, they take advantage of you. Because they know you got insurance and they want all of it. And I remember the woman saying, as we sat at the conference table, we have a beautiful plot here that it's a young sapling has just been... Uh, planted there and in a couple years there'll be a tree that hangs over the graveyard and there's already a bench there you can come and you can visit your loved one and I lie not we I began to laugh sister Lincoln too we, we started laughing and she thought it was odd and I told her ma'am once we bury this baby I'll never be back here <laughs> I'll never come back it's been ever how long how many years baby 18 years I ain't been back once my daddy's pointing right over beside her. I, what, for what? They ain't there. Right. Either you believe it or you don't. I know sometimes we get our minds so earthly where it's, it's the anniversary. <laughs> I have to go take flowers to the, to the grave. <laughs> and we sit out there and we get our hearts so sorry. <laughs> so sorry for. What are you doing? Tiffany's not there. She's saved. He sits in the right hand of the Father on high and she's right up in there somewhere with him. Either you believe that or you don't. But if you'll keep your mind stayed on him, he'll keep you in peace. But when you keep your mind on this earth and the things of this earth, you will always be miserable. Always be miserable. Somebody said, well, I don't believe that. Well, don't believe it. And good luck to you. I hope you make it. <laughs> but it's for me and my house. We're going to put our trust in the Lord. We're going to live for Jesus Christ. Somebody said, it sounds like you didn't even love your baby. <laughs> I don't quite know how to say this. I have, Jesus has given me an education. I'm not a kindergartner in the things of the faith anymore. I have learned some things. Now when Sister Lincoln dies, I, I probably have, she probably go before I do. That she, she wants to go before I do. Cause she don't want me to leave her here. <laughs> but if she goes, I, no doubt I'm gonna cry a few tears. But I don't plan on missing that one week in this pulpit preaching Jesus Christ. Not one single week. When my daddy died, I preached the, I preached the funeral for him. I preached the strong too. Preaching to my family. 
Tell him you're going to be in his box one day. You need to get right with God. <laughs> But here's my whole point for, for all of us is that as we keep our minds stayed on him, it's not just perfect peace that comes on your heart. There is a supernatural strength that comes into your life that is beyond all. You don't have to try to be strong. It's just there. It's just there. In the fourth watch of the night, uh, and in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them walking on the sea. Here's my point. The very same trial that were causing them all the commotion and all the fear and all the anguish, it had no impact on Jesus Christ whatsoever. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, it is a spirit. <laughs> they looked out there and the rain's hitting them in the eyes and the wind is blowing, the lightning's flashing, and they're looking and... Man, that, what is that? Is that a guy walking on the water? Here's Jesus. In the midst of your fear, in the midst of your uncertainty, when you don't know how the, the, the job that you lost is going to play out, you don't know how the trouble in your marriage is going to play out, here's what Jesus says. Be of good cheer. It is I. Be not afraid. Hallelujah. Whenever God sent an angel to talk to a human, the first words are, fear not. Get that fear out of your heart. God had not given you the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. He don't want you walking in fear. Fear is the opposite of faith. And the opposite, let me change it. The opposite of faith. Oh, this is so good. Fear is different from faith. But the exact opposite of faith is control. <laughs> it's control we like to control things and when we're not in control now we have to exercise faith and dependence upon him <laughs> he said straightway Jesus spake unto them be of good cheer now listen listen now when he said, be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid, the waves were still rising and falling. And that ship would go up and down as he's speaking. Lightning's flashing in the background, thunder's roaring, the waves are, the waves are coming across the top of the ship. It's all still happening when he said, be of good cheer. Whether you're in the storm or out of the storm, he's still God. He's still God. You know, for the most part, Peter was a failure in his early walk with Jesus Christ. Nobody got in trouble like Peter. <laughs> he stayed in trouble. He was on the Mount of Transfiguration, and the Father had to tell him, hold your peace, Peter. Here, this is my beloved son. Hear him. Shut up, man. You talk too much. <laughs> he came right down off the top of the mountain, and he tells Peter, uh, Jesus, concerning his crucifixion, far be that from you, Lord. You're not going to die on the cross. And Jesus had to tell him, get behind me, Peter. You're an offense to me. Peter stayed in trouble. And even at the point that Jesus was leaving this earth at the crucifixion, Peter was the first one to pick up a sword and try to chop the head of servant of Malchus off. He tried to murder a man right in front of the Lord in the name of the Lord. He got it wrong a lot. Does it remind you of anybody else? <laughs> but he still made something out of Peter and he's still going to make something out of you <laughs> Peter answered him and said Lord if it be thou bid me come unto thee on the water <laughs> oh I like that and Jesus said come on <laughs> he's saying the same thing to you this, this morning Aside from the problems, the weaknesses, the missteps, the brokenness, he said, come on. Man. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, I know this is not a misprint. He walked on the water to go to Jesus. Now, you and I both know enough about physics to know that you can't fill your bathtub full of water and stand on top of it. We all understand that. It's impossible. Here's what it means. Jesus will cause you. First of all, he put forth a word. Come. Come on. He put forth a word. He's given you and I 66 books. 
And it means that he has given you what you need to walk in a place of impossibility. It's impossible for an ex-crackhead to be preaching the gospel. It's impossible for a man who's been divorced for six years to be married to his wife, both of them saved and full of the Holy Ghost and given a church to pastor. That's impossible. It's impossible for somebody that barely got a high school education, no college, no seminary, to, to start in a storefront no bigger than this platform, and now we're here. That's impossible. But if you'll just walk on his word, walk on his word, just walk out there on it. Don't be afraid. And the Bible says Peter walked on the water, but he didn't just go anywhere. <laughs> When you're walking, you walk in the direction you're looking. Nobody walks like this, unless you're crazy. <laughs> you walk where you're looking. It means that when Peter got out of the ship, stepped on the water, he began to walk with his mindset, I'm going to Jesus. He had his mind and his focus upon Jesus Christ as he went there. And he was walking, as I said, in a place of absolute impossibility. That same thing exists for you and I. Uh, but it's not without challenge. Verse 30 says, but when he saw the wind boisterous. Peter, why are you looking at the wind, brother? Why aren't you continually looking at Jesus? Why did he stop being your focus? You now focus on the wind. Are you with me today? Yeah. See, you and I, when you got saved, your whole focus was on Jesus Christ. How did your focus move somewhere else? How did you stop looking at Jesus and look at your, your aspirations to be a YouTube hero? How did all that change? When he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink. I got to hurry. Man, I'm, I'm, I, I ran out of time. And beginning to sink, he cried saying, Lord, save me. <laughs> and immediately. Is that word immediately means right now. That word means as soon as Peter says, save me, the Lord stretched forth his hand and saved him. You are in the safest place that you can possibly be when you keep your mind stayed on him. Amen. Keep your whole mind stayed on him. Oh yeah, the waves may go up and down. He told us, he said the stream would beat vehemently against your house, but it fell not for it was founded upon a rock. Amen. Glory to God. You don't have to be afraid. Just keep, this is the secret of salvation. It's not a well-kept secret. It's, it's all over the book. It's just many times we don't practice ourselves in following it. Musicians, wherever you are, would you please come back to the stage? I want to share one last scripture as they're coming. Hebrews chapter 12. The Holy Spirit puts this again. Verse 1, it says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witness... Let us in the church lay aside every weight and the sin that doth so easily beset us. And let us run the race with patience. The, 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 the race is your life. Let us run the race with patience. Let's run with patience the race that is set before us. Here it is. Looking unto Jesus. Looking unto Jesus. Don't take your mind, your heart, your focus off of him. If you're married today, you and your husband look to Jesus at the same time, the same, come together. Talk about your faith being in him. It will strengthen one another. Hallelujah. Would you bow your heads, please, all over the room. Father, we love you this morning. Thank you for the wisdom that comes from above, not of this earth. Thank you this morning, oh God, for your goodness and your kindness. Help us, Lord, to embrace what we've heard today. Send the convicting power of your Holy Spirit as our minds stray to the things of this world that you pull us back to the book. Pull us back to fellowship with your Holy Spirit. And all over the room, I'm going to ask you if you would stand, if you're able to stand, would you stand this morning? You know where you are in your walk. You know how much attention you're given to the Lord over the past weeks. 
And based on what you heard today, I want you to just reach out of your heart and just begin to talk to God. Lord, this is the solution to my problem. This is what I've needed all the time to refocus my heart and life upon Jesus Christ. Lord, I come to you this morning. I bid you to have me come walk with you on the water. Come on, just reach out and you ask him this morning concerning your situation. Lord, I want to walk on the water with you. Bid me come walk with you, Jesus. Come on, reach out. Just reach out to the Lord this morning. Just reach out. Hallelujah. Hear our prayers, Lord God. We want to walk with you on that water, Lord God. You called each of us to come out, to come out from the world and to walk with you. Oh, Lord, we say yes. Yes, Lord, we want to walk with you. We want to walk in the supernatural, in the things of God, in the power of God, to, to let go of the darkness and the things of this world and to press forward into the things which are above God. Hallelujah. We thank you for the word this morning. We thank you, Lord God, that you are calling us out to be with you. Hallelujah. We thank you, Lord. We thank you for what you're doing here today. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Wasn't that good this morning? Give God praise. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Hallelujah. He's called all of you to walk on the water with him. When you say that's impossible, yeah, that's right. What he's called you to do is the impossible. It's not possible in our strength. Hallelujah. But he's calling you. Come, come. Come walk with me. Get your mind on the things which are above. And let go of this world. Amen. Praise God. Well, we appreciate all you visitors. Again, we thank you for coming to sit with us. Make sure you pick up a gift bag on the way out if you're a visitor. Uh, make sure you greet some people around you. Love on them. And uh, you are dismissed. We'll see you next time. God bless. Thank you for watching. And please, subscribe. You can also find more of our videos in our archives at ChristUnveiled.org. We'll see you next time.